The Idaho Four Murders continues to be one of the most grisly, haunting, and puzzling crime cases out there. The brutal slaying of the four students has left everybody searching for hours as to who is responsible and what the motive could have been. It's now been over six weeks since the murders occurred, and the public's interest and wild theories and the case speculation is still at an all-time high. With new information, footage, and tips being released daily, it's hard to decipher what is fact and what is fiction. So today, we're going to review where the case currently is at. We're going to discuss the possible profile of this mass murderer and just have an honest conversation about everything that has been going on. Hey guys, I'm Annie Elise. This is 10 to Life. Let's dive right in. 10 to Life with Annie Elise starts right now. It's been over six weeks now since the horrifying and brutal murders of the University of Idaho students, Maddie, Kaylee, Ethan, and Zanna. We are in the midst of the holiday season now, and as New Year's approaches, I can't stop thinking about their families. Missing their loved ones, the unknowns, wanting for an arrest so badly, hoping for an update every second of the day, just begging for answers, all to wake up the next day and go through it all over again. It's absolutely tragic, and I just can't imagine what they are going through each day. However, they're not alone in their hunger for answers. From the beginning, this case was almost an instant media sensation, and many people from all over the world want to know who is responsible for this heinous and just sick, sick crime that took the lives of four young adults. I wish I had the answers, guys, but I don't have the answers. The completely unfounded rumors in this case are running rampant online, and it's hard to know where to get information from, truthfully. But today, I'm going to go over some of the more noteworthy updates that have happened since my last video. If this is your first time hearing about this case, which I highly doubt, I think the whole world has heard about it by now, definitely check out my playlist and my previous videos to get caught up because we do more deep dives on those. But this is definitely where you're going to want to watch for the updates and just kind of talk through what's been going on here. So let's get right into the latest video and talk about it and what it means for the case. A Facebook case discussion group released a video to Fox News, and at first it was just a still image with the audio. Later, News Nation received both the audio and the video portion. The video shows Kaylee and Maddie walking with the hoodie guy from the corner club to the grub truck. Now, the hoodie guy has literally been indicted, convicted, and sentenced by people on the internet, even though the police have said that he was cleared. Despite that, it seems like it's gone in one ear and out the other to so many people on so many different levels. And not just him, several others. I think that the Facebook group's intention when releasing this video was to show that, you know, hey, look, he wasn't stalking them, he was hanging out with them, but instead, it opened a new can of worms for another person who has now entered into this case as a key player. You know, we know that police have had this surveillance video since a few days after the murders, but we are now just seeing it for the first time. And it is not just video, there is also audio. Surveillance video newly obtained by News Nation shows what appears to be Kaylee Gonzalez and her best friend Maddie Mogan walking in downtown Moscow, Idaho, just hours before they were murdered. You can hear their voices in the video. For the first time, we are hearing the name Adam. The attorney representing the Gonzalez family says they believe Adam is a bartender and that he is not a suspect at this time. The Moscow Police Department not commenting specifically on the video, but in a statement to News Nation said any digital content submitted as tips and leads becomes part of the investigation. We review and investigate submissions. Findings become part of the information we do not make public to maintain the integrity of the investigation. So I'm going to play the video twice because it is so short, but just take a listen. So honestly, when I first saw this, I was like, okay, who's Adam and what did Maddie tell him? Obviously, I think everybody was wondering that. And I watched it a few times. Now, maybe it's just me and I could totally be wrong, but it sounded like Kaylee didn't want Adam to know something, but that Maddie went ahead and told him anyway. Now, my next thought while watching this was, if your name is Adam and you happen to have a white Elantra, even if you live on a different continent 
or if your name is Adam and you've ever even thought about going to Idaho in the past, Godspeed because the public is coming for you. That's just how the internet has been lately. It is like the Wild West out there. So shortly after the surveillance audio was released, Kaylee's dad, Steve, spoke out and said that the police were already aware of this video and that they know who Adam is, that he's a bartender at the Corner Club, and that the girls knew him and that Adam had nothing to do with the murders. To the best of my knowledge, Adam is a friend and either a roommate or previous roommate of Kaylee's ex-boyfriend, Jack. Then these pictures surfaced on a Facebook group, and they are pictures of still images from the Corner Club surveillance video. You can clearly see both Kaylee and Maddie talking to a guy in these pictures. We don't know who this is for sure, but a lot of people online are saying that this looks like Kaylee's ex, Jack. And I have to admit, it really does look like it could be him. But it also looks like just a normal night at a college bar with Jack or whoever this person is standing here smiling. Now, personally, I don't think Jack is involved, which I'm going to get to later. But in effort to play devil's advocate and discuss all possibilities here, let's talk about why people think that and how after listening to a few old interviews, it could possibly make sense to someone. Jack's aunt spoke out recently and confirmed that Kaylee and Jack's split was amicable and a mutual decision. Kaylee's family also stated early on that the breakup was also amicable and that they were behind Jack 1000%. However, her sister also said in that interview that the breakup was Kaylee's idea. It wasn't a mutual decision. So it could be that perhaps it appeared amicable, but maybe Jack was harboring some sort of resentment or anger over it if it was Kaylee's decision. Sure, it's possible. Kaylee's sister also said that she and Jack still talked every day and that they were actually on the verge of getting back together and how they even talked every day for the last week and a half that she was home. If we keep hearing this name Jack and phone calls going back and forth. There, can you tell us anything about that? We love Jack. Absolutely love Jack. We stand behind Jack 1,000%. Jack was Kaylee's boyfriend for many years. They just recently broke up. There was no animosity at all. It was a breakup on Kaylee's point. It was not, they still talked every single day. Kaylee just thought that she needed a little break. They were on the mends of getting back together. Kaylee talked to Jack the whole time. She was here for that week and a half. We also know Kaylee was rapid fire calling Jack the hour before she was murdered, and that Maddie also tried calling him multiple times. We know that one of the last messages that Kaylee sent was pleading for him to come over and saying how they shared a dog together. Um, one been... of her messages, one of her last messages, she reached out to Jack and said, Jack, get back to me. And he didn't. She goes, we share a dog together, which they did. She's like, you need to reach out to me. So please come over. She was wanting Jack to come over. Now, on my video about a month ago, I went over this, and I mentioned how it seemed like maybe the rapid calling was either just Kaylee drunk dialing, which, girls, we've all done it, I think, at some point, and wanting to talk to Jack, or because she was maybe trying to get a hold of him to apologize for something. And the reason I said that was because of the dog comment from Kaylee's dad, and how he said that one of the last messages was to Jack saying to come over and how they shared a dog together, and how it sounded to me like maybe Kaylee was trying to lure or guilt Jack into talking to her or coming over, saying, you know, please talk to me, we share a dog together, you have to talk to me, you, you can't just ignore me, or you can't just leave me all alone this, like, you know, trying to reel him back in. And I say that because, guys, I've been there. It's not my finest hour, but I've done something like that before in my past with an ex. I'm sure many of you guys watching have done something like that where you feel like you're losing your grasp and you're like, wait, but we share this together. Wait, but we have to talk about this, whatever it may be. So Kaylee's dad had said that one of her last messages to Jack was this, saying, please talk to me. We share a dog together. That coupled with the rapid fire calling led me to suspect and still believe that she was trying to either make amends for something or repair something with him. Maybe even trying to get him to forgive her or apologize for something due to anger he potentially maybe had stemming from the breakup. But now with this new Adam conversation and information, many think, and I suppose it's possible, that Maddie did tell Adam something that she wasn't supposed to, and that he told his buddy Jack. Then Kaylee panicked, started calling Jack nonstop to do damage control, and when he didn't answer, she had Maddie try calling him. Then that didn't work, so she sent a message saying, please call me, we share a dog together, you know, yada, 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 as one last-ditch effort to try to get him to contact her so that she could fix whatever had happened, or whatever he had found out. On the other hand, 
Kaylee and Maddie were lifelong best friends, sisters almost, so I have a hard time imagining that she would betray her or wrong her in some way right in front of her and then nonchalantly say, yeah, I told Adam everything. But to be fair, sometimes when you are drunk and young, you do stupid things and like they say, loose lips sink ships, so possibly. Now, if Jack did find out something, such as Kaylee maybe hooking up with somebody else or lying to him about something, especially if they were on the verge of getting back together as her sister indicated, it certainly could explain motive. But to be honest, I can't imagine Jack would be so upset by hearing something about Kaylee, even if she did hook up with somebody else, that he would choose to go and quite literally butcher four people inside that house. I mean, anything is possible, and I don't know about Jack personally or his traits or his characteristics, but that's a huge leap to get to and built on circumstances that we're assuming or completely guessing on. Another thing, like Steve, Kaylee's dad said, this isn't new information to the police, and they've already cleared Jack, the ex-boyfriend. And Kaylee's sister also said that calling people late at night over and over was normal for her, which again is totally understandable if you've ever been young and come home from the bars drunk after a night of long drinking and you just start rapid fire calling. At least it was normal for me. And as far as Adam, I think if he were somehow caught up in this, we wouldn't be six weeks into the investigation looking for a white Elantra and also extending the search for surveillance video 24 miles away, which is something we're going to get to shortly. So unless something else comes out and changes all of this, I'm going to take the police and Steve at their word here since they know a lot more information than we do. Like I said earlier, Jack's aunt spoke out and said that Jack is mourning the love of his life. She said things very similar to what Kaylee's family initially said when they spoke about Jack being 1000% innocent, saying that Kaylee and Jack probably would have been married and had kids, that kind of bond, that kind of relationship. Now, I don't know if you've ever experienced a similar situation when you were young and you broke up with someone that you felt like you were destined to be with, but it's a horrible feeling. So combining all of that with this person also being brutally murdered, I can't even imagine. Then, to make things even worse, Jack is also being blamed by half the country for being responsible for committing these crimes, which his aunt has also said has been extremely hard, and he's heartbroken over that, too. They're, Jack is um, is is not, um, they're wasting their time with Jack, and, mm. and, and Jack is just as distraught as we are. Um, Jack is our family. Jack is 100%, 2,000% our family, and Jack is with us. And, and we stand behind him 100%. We are supporting him. And we know in our hearts and our minds and our souls, in the depths of our souls, um, Jack is hurting. And he and, and, and Kaylee and Jack would have eventually been married. They would have eventually been married and they would have eventually had children together. So to say ex-boyfriend, it, 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 it was Kaylee just being a brat, you know, being like, I just need a break. But... Jack was in her heart, and, and, and they, they, they were close to getting back together. And that was just Kaylee being Kaylee. So, absolutely, um, Jack is, no. We, we, we don't think he's a suspect. At all. Wow. She said he's also struggling with the thought of returning to Moscow because so much of his life there for the past few years was with Kaylee right by his side which I don't blame him at all for that struggle, and my heart goes out to any of the friends, acquaintances, sorority, fraternity members, any of them that knew Kaylee, Maddie, Zanna, or Ethan at school that now feel like they can't go back there. It's a devastating situation all around. So another video was released which had body cam footage from back in September on the 1st. The footage was from a noise complaint at the girl's house at 1122 King Road where the girls were living. I'm not going to play the whole thing here, but the video is available for anybody who wants to see it. We've already heard that this was a party house, and it is. It's a typical college house close to campus and Greek life on campus, but nothing nefarious. Now, in the video, the boys who answer the door say that the people who live there aren't there. Now, personally, I think that they were lying, and I think that the girls were there, but I think that maybe they were just too scared to talk to the police for some reason, but I could be wrong. Who knows? Either way, the police used one of the guy's phones to call Maddie. Hey ladies, how's it going? Oh, hi, how are you? Good. Um, uh, we're not actually... I don't you don't know the No, no, I don't. Here for noise and noise. Oh, okay. Hey, hey. Yeah, they did. You don't have the door. Hey, who's the owner, uh, or who lives here? Okay, thank you, please. This is Officer Walsh, Moscow Police Department. Who am I speaking with? 
Maddie, one second. We turn the volume up on on this uh, on this phone here. All right, can you hear me, Maddie? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Do you live at 1122 uh, Queen Street? Yes, I do. Okay. So, hey, the reason that we're here is that we received a noise complaint um, of loud music, partying. Okay. Once we approached the the house, uh, people started running away. Uh, dealt a bunch of alcohol behind. We're not even coming for alcohol. We're coming for the noise complaint. And then we sat here for approximately 10 minutes trying to knock on the door. No one would come to the door until these two gentlemen came down and actually answered the door. So, and, and what's your first name? Maddie? And how do you spell that, Maddie? My like legal name is Madison. It's M-A-D-I-S-O-N. What's your middle name, Madison? May, M-A-Y. Okay. What's your last name? Mogen, M-O-G-E-N. M-O-G-E-N? Yep. Okay. What's your date of birth, Madison? Okay. Uh, and is, uh, what's your current address? 1122 King Road. Okay. And are you a student at uh, U of I? Yep. Okay. I will graduate with a bachelor's. I'm still being my master's. All right, Madison. So here's the deal. Okay, they've already said that no one here lives at, uh, like, none of the, the occupants that live at this address are here right now. So now you have a house full of random people. Um, you need to let them know that the noise needs to needs to come down. Okay, we just received a, a noise complaint. We want that music turned down. Um, and we don't want to come back again tonight. If we have to come back again tonight, then there's going to be even more problems, okay? I see both sides. Sounds good. I'm, I'm just as frustrated. I'm also so sorry once again. If I were you guys, I'd probably just come home and make sure that whoever is, is, is partying here is keeping it down to a minimum, okay? Um, yeah, we're going to all of them. Okay. So at this point... Um, we're going to leave, okay? Uh, and again, if I have to come back later tonight, like I said, I, I just want to express that there's going to be some uh, some citation. Now, I don't really know if there's much to talk about with this video. Other than that, for now, I've seen some speculation about a window, but I'm hoping that there can be more information released from the police about that. Other than that, I think what this video illustrates the most is that it shows and proves that the house was open and accessible, that people were coming and going, and that it was a party house. But I'm not sure that it means that anyone close to any of them had anything to do with it, simply from attending these parties at this college house in the past. I mean, if anything, if this was a frequent occurrence to have these kinds of parties, it kind of seems to me that anyone could have figured that out about this house. If they just watched this house for a few weekends, they could easily spot the pattern. Perhaps the killer was staking out a few places close to campus and settled on this one. I don't know. At this point, I'm just not sure that I believe anyone close to the victims is responsible. So just bear with me for a second and let's go over why. But I do want to give a little disclaimer here, guys. I could totally be wrong here and this is just my opinion. So please feel free to comment and let me know your thoughts as well as do your own research. Some of the things that Kaylee's dad has said to the media has really stuck with me and got me thinking. If you remember from my last video, we talked about the conversation that Steve had with the coroner in that interview with Fox. Steve asked how many times the victims had been stabbed. Right here, Steve is quoting his recollection of what Kathy said, and her response was, Sir, I don't think stabs is the right word. It was like tears, like this was a strong weapon, not a stab. Steve elaborated more and said that she said that these were big open gouges, saying that it was quick and that this wasn't something where you were going to be able to call 911 and that they were not going to slowly bleed out. He also said that a knife slashed open Kaylee's liver and lungs. In this interview, Steve added his frustration with the police, saying they're just being cowards and that there are girls walking around the street right now that deserve to know that they should be looking out for a sadistic male. He also clarified his thoughts on whether he thought Maddie or Kaylee was the target, and he said he didn't know, but that he had his suspicions. Ethan and Zana were found on the second floor, and according to Steve, it was a hell of a battle going on down there from what the coroner told him. So to me, he's describing a rare type of killer. The sick, evil, deranged, sadistic, especially heinous type prolific serial murderers that we've heard horror stories about. I don't know, to me, it just doesn't seem that far off. This is a rare crime which is also why the public interest is so heightened with it, because it isn't something we hear or see every day or even every few years for that matter. It's rare. 
And I think Steve calling the police cowards for not coming forward and being honest with the public about what kind of person they're looking for, but instead them going over the definition of targeted over and over again, when that's probably the least of their concerns, speaks volumes. Meanwhile, the Gonzalez family is questioning whether the investigation is being handled properly by Moscow police, especially within the first 48 hours after the murders. Their attorney spoke to News Nation's Chris Cuomo. From the get-go, we still get more and more information every day about mishaps or missteps that I think the investigation has made. You know, one of the questions we asked when we went in was, why not, within the tw first 24 to 48 hours, release some information about, we're looking for someone that may have missed work, that may have uh, come in with, you know, injuries to their forearms or their hands, things like that. It's a small, small community. Um, people that have taken a vacation immediately, things like that, that, that normal things that may be abnormal to people that live in the community and getting that out. Um, and they said they didn't do it because of an investigative reasons. So police say that the pace will remain the same, but still no major updates. Uh, they haven't released any suspect information or a person of interest, uh, but they insist this is not a cold case. Now, it's possible they aren't sharing what kind of person this is with the public simply to not cause public hysteria, freak people out, or to ruin the university's enrollment until it's all sorted out. I'm not sure. Again, just my opinion, but there's a few more things that make me think that. From the very beginning of this investigation, the FBI was immediately brought in, along with two agents from the Behavior Analysis Unit. These agents are specialists in creating a profile of who a killer could be, what they do, and so forth. Also, the governor of Idaho quickly approved funding for a $1 million funding increase to help solve this. In a recent Moscow PD update, it said that they have brought even more FBI agents in and now have 60 agents working this case locally and remotely. So if the person responsible for this was so easy to pick out or someone even remotely close to the victim's social circles and who did in fact target one of the students personally, how can all of that extra manpower be explained? especially now that it's been almost six weeks. The staffing and the funding seems much more in line with a massive push to get a public threat and danger off the streets by all means necessary, rather than an individual who targets someone specifically and is not a threat to the general public. Now add in the white Elantra that police and everyone is looking for. Why on earth has that person not come forward? Police are following surveillance, and now it's been reported that they have extended their search for even more surveillance, 24 miles outside of Moscow. They've pulled 22,000 vehicle registrations to try to narrow it down and find this car, which it seems to me like they really, really want to speak with this person. And again, I can really only think of one reason that this car owner hasn't come forward already on their own. Certainly, they're not living under a rock and are familiar with the case, so why aren't they speaking up? unless they have something to hide. There have been people online who have reported white Elantras that they've seen, and none of those tips have come to fruition as far as providing anything relevant to the police. News Nation cameras there as two investigators show up at the house in Moscow, Idaho, where four college students were murdered. 37 days after the killings, the investigators carrying a black case went inside. 20 minutes later, the investigators came out, but did not answer questions. Sir, can you can you tell us what you were looking for while you were back at the house? Do you know anything about the Hyundai Elantra found in Oregon? Moscow police confirm they are aware of a Hyundai Elantra located in Eugene, Oregon, the same model they are looking for in connection with the murders. Police say they are working with investigators in Oregon to determine if the car is related to the case. Police in Oregon say they have no information to indicate the vehicle is related. When police did make that public statement to say that the crashed Elantra in Oregon was not connected, they also asked the public to please not harass the owner of the car because the public mob was coming after them. So far, the Elantra that they're looking for is still unknown, and police are still combing through evidence and urging people to think about if they even own that car and possibly let somebody else drive it that night. They're looking for any tip possible. I don't know for certain whether the person driving that car had something to do with it or not, but I don't think it's a far stretch to think that the killer could be some outlier individual. Maybe someone that only knew the victims from afar? A sick, creepy, twisted individual that randomly targeted the victims and the house like a true psychopath that was carrying out some type of perverted fantasy? Maybe they planned this. And I mean, I hate to say it, but they aren't doing the worst job evading police so far. At this point, at least for me, 
I really think it's possible, but I want to know what you guys think. I say all of this because there are people out there blaming innocent friends and acquaintances of Kaylee, Madison, Ethan, and Zanna and harassing them online. Even more disturbing, the attorney for Kaylee's family recently told News Nation that the family is receiving harassment, threats, phone calls, texts, you name it, which is just so disgusting and screwed up, and it literally irks me to even repeat that. How people can be harassing them in a time like this is just unnerving and beyond. And the worst part is, police have already said that all of these individuals are not believed to be involved in the crime, yet they're still being harassed. And sure, sometimes police don't share all the information, but what if it really is someone we don't know about that nobody on the internet is talking about? A true psychopath, sadistic, evil monster. Now, I know police have ruled out other incidents of stabbings and animal killings, but what if they initially said that because this crime went up a notch in terms of the violent nature? Look, I don't want to get too graphic here, but maybe this was an escalation from past acts. Not to get full-blown conspiracy on you, but what if there's something more to that? Because think about it, with the poor little dog that was skinned in Moscow that is supposedly unrelated, here's my question. If it's not related, then who in the hell did that? Is there a mass murderer and another psycho going around skinning pets and taking their fur with them in this small town? What's the likelihood of that? And I also wonder, is there surveillance video from when that occurred in the nearby area? And if there is, is there a white Elantra on that footage? Now look guys, I could be way off here and I'm not saying it's related, it just makes me wonder. What's the likelihood of two people doing horrific crimes that are so brutal, so graphic, so personal like that? It makes me wonder. All we know for sure at this point is that the police are saying they either don't know or are not sharing where the killer may have relocated. Is there any way of, of knowing right now, and again, I know there's things you can't say, but of whether this, uh, this murderer is, is still in the area or it may be far away by now? Like I said, um, we're not uh, disclosing any of that, but um, there's some of that we just don't know at this point. We're still trying to put everything together. Um, we've said all along that um, we need people to be vigilant. We need people to uh, pay attention because we're not sure exactly where the individual is. We also know now that the girls did in fact take a rideshare that night, even though there was a lot of back and forth about it being a private party versus an Uber, like Kaylee's sister originally had said. As of last week, that driver has come forward and said that nothing out of the ordinary that night happened and that there were no conversations between the girls in the back seat that was concerning, that seemed like there was any drama going on, that it was just a normal night. Nobody lurking by the house during drop-off, nobody following him, and he also has allegedly been vetted and cleared by police via a Taco Bell receipt. Getting a little late-night stack of his own, munching down on a gordita crunch, I don't know, but good thing he did because apparently that cleared him. It's been over six weeks since these horrific murders took place, and to be honest, it feels like we are still at square one. Sure, the police are not going to share everything with the public, and I'm certainly not trying to bash them, but I do think if there was a solid lead or potential evidence that pointed to a sole suspect, we would have more information or even maybe see an arrest by now. It's a bit disheartening, and I just pray that this case doesn't go cold and that the police are sitting on some secret massive piece of evidence that will eventually blow this entire case wide open so that justice can finally be had. The attorney representing the Gonzalez family told Ashley Banfield he has concerns about the experience of detectives, especially the lead investigator on the case. My understanding is that he was hired in 2020 as a rookie, and so he has a total of two years experience. The Moscow police chief responded this way. I know there's been some questions about the leadership in this investigation. What I want people to know is this is a Moscow Police Department investigation. We're utilizing the resources of the FBI and the state police, um, but we pick the investigators. Um, my command team oversees this. We have 94 years of experience um, between us. So the police chief there wanting to make clear that they are still in control of this investigation, that they have the experience here locally. They also have about 60 FBI agents assisting them with the case. But still now, 37 days later, Nicole, uh, no suspect and no persons of interest. All right, so Brian, 37 days later, but a lot of tips still coming in on this. Yeah, a ton of tips. I was going over the numbers today. I mean, we're talking like more than 10,000 tips when you add up the digital tips and the emails uh, and the calls. They've been going through them, them all. Most of the tips get routed to the FBI center because there's just so many. They've been overloaded uh, here in Moscow. They've also done uh, 250 interviews all related uh, to this case, Nicole. 
So rather than asking you who you think is responsible, I want to ask you this. What kind of person do you think the killer is? Do you think that they are someone close to the victims, somebody who knew the victims, or do you think that this was somebody disconnected from them and completely random? Comment below with what you think and why. I'm curious. I continue to follow this case very closely, guys, but also I don't want to just jump on here every single day or multiple times a day talking all rumor speculation when there's not really any comprehensive overview to talk about with the case. So I promise I am going to keep you guys updated when we have more information to compile and an update to actually give rather than just churning out videos left and right for you. But that being said, if something does break in this case at the drop of a hat and it's hard for me to jump on YouTube to get that out for you, I always do my updates also on Instagram. So make sure you're following along there. If you're not already, it's at underscore Annie Elise. That's the quickest way to see updates because I can jump on there way faster than I can come over and upload on YouTube. So follow along there if you haven't already. All right, guys, thanks again for tuning in today. Don't forget, let me know in the comment section. Comment if you think that this is somebody who was close to the victims and knew them, or if you think that this is somebody completely disconnected. And in addition to which type of person you think it is, let me know why. All right, guys, thanks again for tuning in. Please don't forget, smash that like button, subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already so that you'll be notified of updates in this case. And until the next one, stay safe. Bye.